Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law, and Second Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, Ms. Lai Wei Lin, Co-Founder and Group Chief Operating Officer, C. Mr. Ye Kang, NUS President, Prof. Tang E. Chai, NUS Senior Deputy President and Provost, Prof. Ho Teck Hua, Deans, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good morning and welcome to the launch of the College of Humanities and Sciences. I am Sneha, a third year student from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. And I'm Xavier, a final year student from the Faculty of Science. To begin, it is my pleasure to invite Prof. Robbie Go, CHS Co-Dean and Dean, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, to deliver his welcome remarks. Prof. Go, please. Ms. Lai Wei Lin, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law and Second Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education. Mr. Ye Kang, Co-Founder and Group Chief Operating Officer, C. Professor Tan Eng Chai, NUS President. Professor Ho Teck Wah, NUS Senior Deputy President and Provost. Distinguished guests, students, colleagues, alumni, good morning. After many months of planning and preparation, it's a pleasure, finally, to be able to share about the College of Humanities and Sciences with you. The CHS project arose out of our recognition that the world and the workplace are changing rapidly and the education has to respond to these changes. Some of the forces that are responsible for these changes include technology and especially artificial intelligence, the vast amounts of data in modern society, the increasingly connected global order, and the complexity of, of issues in that global order. All this means that many existing jobs are rapidly becoming obsolete as we have seen while challenging new jobs are constantly being created. NUS, as an educational institution, has the responsibility to change the way we prepare our students so that they are equipped with the right skills to thrive in this economy. As such, we formed the CHS, an enhanced undergraduate experience for students of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Science. The chief feature of the CHS curriculum is an emphasis on interdisciplinarity and the integration of different disciplines and knowledge domains, an approach necessary to tackle the complex issues of the day. One such pressing issue is climate change. We will need to rely on environmental studies to identify cause and effect, economics to optimize the cost-benefit balance, data analytics to develop mathematical models, policy expertise to incentivize positive action, sociological methods to understand the dynamics of social responsibility, and many other disciplinary forms of expertise. With the CHS, we aim to develop in students the ability to integrate methodologies and knowledge from multiple disciplines and to apply this in real social contexts. So how will we implement this? All CHS students will read a new, carefully curated common curriculum, which consists of 13 modules or one third of their total curriculum. The CHS Common Curriculum will equip students with essential foundation skills in expression, numeracy, computation, and critical thinking. Among the foundational modules are three new general education modules in design thinking, artificial intelligence, and community and engagement. It will also include five new integrated modules organized around two scientific inquiry modules, Asian studies incorporating a focus on Singapore, humanities, and social sciences. Students will also get to choose two out of a slate of exciting interdisciplinary modules, each of which will bring together the methodologies of disciplines in the sciences as well as the humanities and social sciences. With this solid foundation that gives them key skills and exposes them to disciplines in both sciences and the humanities and social sciences, students will have more flexibility and choice than ever before. They will not only be able to choose from any major offered by either FASS or FOS, but will also be able to choose double majors or major minor combinations that span both faculties. This also means that it will be easier for students to obtain double degrees. The flexibility built into the CHS program also means that students can choose multiple educational pathways to cater for their individual interests and inclinations. They can focus more on their chosen major or choose a combination of majors and minors that suits their intended career path. 
So whether they intend to work in the private or public sectors or pursue a doctorate, the CHS will provide the training and pathways to support their ambitions. As you can see, the CHS represents an exciting new approach to learning, one geared to the new challenges that our students will face. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Go. May I now invite Prof Sun Yenang, CHS Co-Dean and Dean Faculty of Science to say a few words. Prof Sun, please. Thank you, Professor Go. A very good morning to Ms. Lao Weiling, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law. Thank you. A okay, very good morning to uh, Ms. Lai Weiling, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law, and Second Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education. Mr. Yi Gang, Co-Founder and Group Chief Operating Officer, C. Prof. Dai Yin Chai, NUS President. Prof. Ho Tei Hua, NUS Senior Pre Deputy President and Provost. Distinguished guests, students, colleagues, and alumni. There have been many questions about the CHS since the news broke earlier this year. And I believe the question on everyone's mind is, what sets us apart? The CHS will herald a number of bold changes to the student experience. But what sets apart can be distilled into three differentiators, curriculum, scale of impact, and flexibility. Firstly, as part of AUS ongoing efforts to stay responsive to change and relevant to market needs, the CHS reimagines higher education by offering a distinct interdisciplinary approach. Over and above providing exposure to different disciplines, the CHS emphasizes the ability to think, synthesize, and integrate knowledge and insights across disciplines. The modules for the common curriculum, which Professor Goh shared earlier, have been carefully created with this goal in mind. They have also been designed based on the in-demand skills in today's job market, such as digital and data literacy, transferable soft skills, and computational thinking. Our second differentiator is the scale of impact. The CHS leverages the combined expertise of two of the largest and most established faculties in Singapore to serve a cohort of approximately 2,000 students per academic year. The size of a cohort will enable more students to benefit from an interdisciplinary education. And on the workplace front, more employers will benefit from a larger cohort of graduates who possess the requisite value-added skills for the complex workplace. To further enhance their work readiness, 
there will be more experiential learning opportunities for students in internships, uh, field work, and capstone projects that will help them gain more real world experience through working with our industry partners. By extending students' learning capacities and competencies across more fields, the CHS will widen opportunities for lifelong learning. Last but not least, the third differentiator of the CHS is the benefit of greater choice and unparalleled flexibility that will be offered to students. Students can pursue breadth and depth across disciplines. From a choice of more than 1,000 modules per academic year. Except for a few selected majors, students admitted to the CHS can pursue any major, second major, major minor, and the specialization pathways offered by both FASS and FOS. By opening up a new world of possibilities and pathways, the CHS enables our students to take better ownership of their learning and development based on their interests, aptitudes, and career aspirations. For instance, they can choose to be versatilists, specialists, or integrators. They can deep dive into a particular discipline to acquire specialist knowledge, or they can opt to pursue breadth through different course combinations to gain knowledge and insights across fields. It will enhance their employability when they graduate and open up diverse industries spanning technology, healthcare, and research that can, uh, they can pursue careers in. The opportunities for CH graduates are wide and varied. And we very much look forward to welcoming our inaugural cohort in academic year 2021-2022. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Soon. May I now invite NUS President Prof Tang Ying Chai to deliver his remarks. Prof Tan, please. Ms. Lai Weiling, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law, and Second Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education. Mr. Ye Kang, co-founder and group chief operating officer, C. Distinguished guests, students, colleagues, and alumni. A very good morning to all of you. First of all, first of all I would like to thank our special guests, Wei Ling and Ye Kang, for joining us at the launch of the new College of Humanities and Sciences, and for their participation in the panel discussion on the future of work. We are privileged to get to hear from two very distinguished young leaders from the public and private sectors. 
I'm sure it will be an interesting and insightful discussion. As Singapore's flagship university, NUS has been at the forefront of providing a solid education and pushing the boundaries of educational innovations. NUS seeks to spearhead integrative, interdisciplinary education. The emphasis on interdisciplinary studies and flexible student-centric pathways is key to our mission of shaping the future of education as a world-class university and also leading this change for the next generation of students. It involves boldly changing the way we have approached and delivered education and shifting our mindsets in order to adapt to the needs of the changing world. I would like to share that interdisciplinary learning is not a new fangled academic approach. NUS has always recognized the importance of interdisciplinary work. This is particularly evident in research where our faculty collaborate with researchers from across the disciplines and across the world. Researchers combine their expertise. They can then obtain larger and better data sets. Hypotheses are tested across multiple locations and settings, and this increases the robustness and impact of research. In education, NUS has experimented with various initiatives over the past 20 years, and along the way, we have learned and improved on them. For example, the Special Programme in Science, the University Scholars Programme, the University Town College Programme, and Yale and US College. Now, with the College of Humanities and Sciences, or CHS, we will be offering our distinct interdisciplinary curriculum at scale. The CHS is the result of two of our largest and most established faculties, faculties of arts and social sciences and faculty of science, both set up in 1929. Coming together to provide and enhance undergraduate experience for all our students. The curriculum and structure has been carefully curated to enrich and equip our students to meet the challenges of the uncertain, volatile, and globally connected world that we now live in. The world today is distinctly different from the time both FASS and FOS were established nearly a century ago. In education, we have evolved from a repository institution for passive knowledge accumulation to one which offers active reflection and application, global and experiential based pathways and interdisciplinary learning. This progressive changes are all about future proving our students, providing them with varied avenues for their career mobility and preparing them to thrive in the future economy. NUS seeks to groom the next generation of thinkers and doers who are agile and flexible and can contribute effectively to nation, economy, and society. The workplace ecosystem, too, has undergone a tectonic shift towards an increasingly dynamic, intricate, and interdependent environment driven by technological changes. Now, it is estimated that 14% of jobs in OECD countries are likely to be automated, while another 32% are 
are at high risk of being partially automated. To stay relevant, our graduates of the future must acquire the skills and also mindsets to adapt and navigate this new terrain and solve complex problems on multiple fronts. The CHS will help address these challenges with, it, with, with its emphasis on interdisciplinary learning and by providing students with opportunities to develop competencies across fields. Through interdisciplinary education, students will learn to harness and integrate knowledge, insights, skills, and experiences across disciplines and environments. They will not be afraid of taking on new disciplines, fresh challenges, or unfamiliar environments. Our students will be able to understand various perspectives and be even more proficient in presenting informed solutions to multifaceted problems. For example, a complex challenge such as combating a virus like COVID-19 takes on more than medical knowledge. It requires a collaborative response that integrates the disciplines of humanities, sciences and social sciences, health economics, social psychology, epidemic modeling, material science, and an understanding of political context are all essential and must work together to save lives in a pandemic. With this launch, I'm pleased to share that the CHS is not a standalone effort, but the very first in the pipeline of new initiatives that NUS will offer in terms of interdisciplinary experiences. Beyond FASS and FOS, students from other faculties and schools will also be able to reap the benefits of interdisciplinary studies in, time, in the time ahead. We will share more about these strategic initiatives in due course. Before I end, I would like to extend my thanks and congratulations to both FASS and FOS for the hard work and dedication in bringing CHS together. We are still in the early days, and I believe I speak for everyone involved that we are fully committed to realizing this massive undertaking. It is certainly a challenging and important task, and I'm very hopeful of what we will achieve together in this new post-COVID world. The future of university education and the future of work have never been more exciting. I now look forward to our panel discussion with Wei Ling and Ye Kang, who will share their views on how education has to adapt to changing times and needs and what is required of the future worker, respectively. I'm sure it will be an interesting exchange of ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Prof Tan. And now, the time has come for the official launch of the College of Humanities and Sciences. May I invite Prof Go and Prof Soon to join Prof Tan on stage for this momentous occasion. Prof Tan, if you may follow me at the count of three. Three, two, one. One of the most pressing and complex issues facing mankind, climate change. 
a shared challenge of the world, demanding a shared solution. Environmental studies to identify cause and effect. Water security to safeguard our water supply. Economic models to optimize cost-benefit balance. Social responsibility to distribute efforts between nations and individuals. Policy formulation to incentivize positive action. Working together to champion the protection of the environment. By driving interdisciplinary solutions for climate change. Together, we can build a shared tomorrow at the College of Humanities and Sciences. Thank you, Prof Tan, Prof Go, and Prof Sun. To mark the launch of the College of Humanities and Sciences, we have organized a very special panel discussion on the future of work. Joining Prof Tan on stage are our two distinguished panelists, Ms. Lai Weilin, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Law, and Second Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Education, and Mr. Ye Gang, Co-Founder and Group Chief Operating Officer, C. Thank you. Good afternoon to all our participants here and also uh, all our remote participants. So the theme of this uh, short discussion is on the future of work. And today we are very privileged to have uh, two of our top leaders in both the public sector as well as the pub private sector uh, sharing some of the insights uh, on this future of work. So interdisciplinarity is the very first step in the transformation of NUS. Aside from the synthesis and integration of disciplines, I think the ability uh, to adapt to rapidly evolving uh, uh, environments is actually one key attribute of uh, when you learn interdisciplinarity. So it begs also the question, um, after university, we are going to work, right? And what's the nature of work? Uh, how can we better prepare our students for jobs that may not yet exist and for jobs that could change tremendously in time to come? So I hope that our panel members can shed uh, some light in this particular aspect. Now, as the moderator, uh, I thought I have the privilege of being able to ask the first two questions. Right. And uh, the first question that I thought I'd like to pose would be to our 2PS, uh, Wei Ling. Right. And uh, she oversees uh, the higher education uh, in uh, MOE. And that includes uh, NUS and the five universities together with the polytechnics and ITE. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what are some of the forthcoming changes that you see in the, uh, the higher education institutions? And uh, how does this actually uh, fit? into some of the things which you are talking about, for instance, the College of Humanities and Sciences. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ing Chai. Uh, first, uh, just to say I'm very happy to be here uh, with NUS today at the launch of the new college um, and to celebrate with the NUS community. I think as Ing Chai said, um, really the world is becoming more unpredictable. I think problems are more complex and multifaceted. And we see many disruptive trends uh, and that transform the way we live, work, and play. And of course, this year with COVID, um, that has also had a far-reaching impact, I think, in everyone's lives, uh, in, on, on firms and then on individual citizens as well. 
Um, I think just to reflect a little bit on education and the broad directions, um, which was in Chai's request, um, I think before I, I go there, um, I thought to maybe say first how we see the university's role uh, in, in the higher education landscape and in the broader uh, society. Um, for the universities, I, I think we see them as really important bridges for every young person, um, the polytechnics and ITE too. But for the universities, um, they are an important bridge between the individual's foundational education in the school system and then in the workplace. So in university, what does a student experience? He acquires sort of deeper domain competencies. Uh, he continues to hone workplace relevant skills like collaboration, uh, intercultural competencies. He also continues to develop um, some of his personal attributes and qualities like resilience, grit, adaptability. So the first role being that bridge uh, in a young person's life and then, as we have embraced lifelong learning, uh, in, especially in the recent years, I think our universities don't just finish their job when the students graduate, but they are also a lifelong companion, uh, supporting their alumni and supporting other graduates throughout their careers in their lifetime. So education is very important to get right, whether at that bridge stage or at the companion stage. And we've constantly grappled with what to teach, when to teach it, how to teach it. I think those are some of the very critical questions in education. And it's often a question around getting the right balance and the sweet spot, um, and also being able to be quite student-centric uh, in, in our efforts. Um, so I thought just to share some observations and taking the cue from a lot of what the deans and Ing Chai yourself said earlier, I think first on breadth and depth. And I think this is a very perennial um, tension that many schools and education institutions um, juggle. So throughout the education system, we've been trying to bring broad exposure to our students, especially at the young age, so they learn a diversity of subjects. So not just the languages, math, science, uh, social studies, humanities, but also art, music, physical education. And over the years, we have evolved. And I, I think when I went to school, A-levels was a little different. Uh, you chose science and then did all science subjects, or you chose arts and you did all art subjects. And now, for many years now, in A-levels, our students take a contrasting subject. So you may be a science student, but you have to take a uh, humanities or social science subject within those four content subjects. Uh, and the value of this breadth um, and multidisciplinary exposure continues into higher education. So many, many universities feature a core curriculum now, and it exposes students to a range of disciplines. And this has been something that many universities have been continuously trying to enhance and upgrade as the demands of the workplace evolve. Uh, now you see things like computational thinking, design thinking, and all that. And we can expect to see more and more uh, of an enriched core curriculum as the years go by. And some students in university offer not just uh, their core major, but they also offer minors on top of their majors. Some offer double majors. Uh, so those are actually increasing as well, I think, in NUS. I see more and more of them. But we also are quite mindful not to undervalue uh, the single disciplinary teaching and learning. Because in certain areas, uh, and for certain students, that's still very important. So universities train students for many different types of career paths. Some of them go into specific professions. So we still need professionals in accountancy. We need doctors, architects, lawyers, people with deep expertise um, in their respective uh, prof professions and disciplines. And also some students actually remain quite single-minded in their interests um, in, in what they want to pursue, and they want to go deep. So I think we do have to balance the breadth and the depth uh, very well and very skillfully. Um, and that's something that uh, even as we see in some areas more and more breadth, more and more multidisciplinary exposure, there will still be some areas where there will be students who are looking in a more focused way about how they want to chart their university experience. Um, then I come to the point about interdisciplinarity, and that's something that we are very glad to see uh, evolve and develop. And that's something that I think transcends a simple juxtaposition of, of breadth and depth. 
Uh, it's about building a new area, sitting at the boundaries of two existing disciplines, creating new knowledge, exploring in that space. And it's not a trade-off between, uh, it's not a trade-off uh, of the depth. Um, actually, people who sit in the interdisciplinary space can be uh, just as uh, deep in terms of their domain expertise, um, but unique in that sense because it sits in the interstitial space between two disciplines. So I thought just my first comment about breadth and depth and I think how we see ourselves going forward and, and managing between the two tensions. I think another area that uh, we are also looking at how we can evolve um, is in incorporating more and more of the real world uh, experiential learning. And I think our, our, our deans also touch on that in their remarks. I think in recent years, we've tried to ramp up our work-study programs. This is where universities um, partner with companies to co-deliver and co-design uh, the learning of the students. And the students spend a significant part of their curriculum time in the companies, learning in a very structured environment with very clear learning objectives. We've also been trying to work on the quality of the internship experience for students, uh, emphasize the importance of this, because internships bring a certain realism uh, to their learning. It tests the application of their knowledge, and it just prepares them for the workforce better. And for those who are keen, actually, they can also explore internships overseas so they understand uh, the regional context and the business context, which is important for Singapore. So directionally, I think we all are looking at how we can embrace more of such uh, experiential real-world learning. And I think Mr. Ye's uh, efforts to support NUS in this area has been really excellent. I think in opening opportunities for NUS students uh, to uh, experience internships and all. Then I think the third thing um, is around, we spoke about flexibility and customized pathways. But underlying that, I think it's this spirit of wanting our students to have that agency and self-directedness in their learning. I think that's also important because we want them to be active learners. We want them to construct and shape their learning in their undergraduate years. So some of the other changes that we've seen, uh, say, move towards more and more aptitude-based admissions supports this because we encourage students to identify their strengths, their interests, their passions a little earlier, build on that, explore it. And when they come to university, when they apply for a place in university, um, the university uh, starts to look at some of these other qualities and interests and accomplishments uh, beyond their grades alone. So in the undergrad years, uh, it's a continuous journey. The university's role is to help to equip the student with the right tools uh, and mindset um, make available the pathways to them uh, so that they can choose, enjoy some of that flexibility, chart their own learning. I think it's from being an active learner in the undergraduate years that we can develop this strong lifelong learning disposition by the time they graduate. And that's very important for them in, the, in their careers for the rest of their lives. You stand them in good stead. Um, so I think those three things, uh, getting that breadth and depth balance right, uh, which is different for different students, incorporating more and more real-world experiential learning and helping students have more self-directedness, agency in deciding and, and shaping their learning. Those are maybe two, uh, three things that are quite important. At the end of it, I think what we hope to see is um, graduates being well-rounded young adults and active lifelong learners, I think for many years to come after they graduate from the university. Thanks. <coughs> Oh, thank you uh, very much, Wei Ling. I think these are three very, very uh, critical points. Um, and I think underlying this, uh, it really uh, explains why the Singapore system is one of the best systems in the world, All right, if not the best. Uh, and uh, we are constantly looking out, watching out on the trends and changes and constantly uh, refining uh, our educational approach. And uh, Willing has highlighted some of the sort of uh, approaches that we are putting more focus on. Okay. Now, uh, let me sort of uh, turn my attention to Ye Kang. All right. Ye Kang is the Group Chief Operating Officer of C. And C is one of the hottest companies uh, that 
many of our graduates aspire to join. Uh, perhaps I can ask Ye Khan to share a little bit of his thinking about how do you see the future workplace evolving? Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Prof. Tan, and uh, thanks, uh, Wei Ling, for the sharing just now. And uh, firstly, uh, a very big congratulations uh, to NUS, to Prof. Tan, Prof. Ho, and the two faculties for the launch of the College of uh, Humanity and Sciences. I think it's uh, certainly a big, big milestone uh, for, for Singapore, for NUS, a good starting point, and also a very good news to all the uh, <clears throat> students or the uh, potential students right, that's uh, coming to NUS to study. I think it's a, it's a very, very good thing. And uh, maybe I can share uh, from two perspectives, one from my personal pers perspective on myself and the one uh, for me as, a, as an employer like uh, in, uh, in Singapore. Right? So for myself, I myself is a, a big beneficiary of uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, education. I studied, I got admitted into one of the uh, a very good university in the U.S., and uh, having studied in Singapore for my secondary and the JC and uh, scored quite good grades, I was ready, you know, to chong to go into my university and uh, and uh, continue the trajectory and uh, do well. I mean, like uh, study hard and get good grades for my uh, university education. But to my very uh, uh, much uh, surprise, in my first meeting with our first year counselor and uh, first year advisor. And uh, he is a very good, uh, very, very good uh, 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 advisor. And, and his advice to me is, he said, Ye Kang, I know you are from Singapore, and I know how Singaporean students study and how, how, uh, how, how, I mean, like what kind of grades you guys are capable of getting. But my advice to you is exactly the opposite. Forget about the grades in university. It doesn't matter after you graduate. You already got your good grades before that, and you already got into a good university. So why not use this chance to explore more and uh, expand your own horizon, your knowledge uh, space, make full use of the resources uh, in the university, and uh, make yourself a, a more round, well-rounded and better person uh, in the process. So I took his advice, and uh, I maximized my first year, and uh, dabbling in many different subjects, like in philosophy, anthropology, history, you know, psychology, and uh, so much so that uh, I found a world that's uh, so much more diverse and more interesting than the original in, uh, the engineering or computer science topics I was uh, you know, spending most of my time in. So, so much so that I decided to actually take uh, psychology as a, as a minor. And, uh, and for that, actually have uh, some implication to myself because I was on a, a Singapore scholarship and uh, there's actually a minimum GPA requirement for my study, right? So, so actually, like, you know, there was... Um, uh, a bit of uh, 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 a struggle for me to, to see, like, because I, I'm not humanity trained. So I, it's my first time who got like, my C's and D's failing grades in, 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 a, in a subject. And uh, yeah, but I'm glad I made the choice. And uh, eventually I finished with uh, two degrees, uh, computer science and uh, uh, economics, uh, dual degrees uh, from the university, as well as two minors, uh, psychology, which... Uh, turned out to be the, the, my favorite uh, uh, subject, and uh, also uh, mathematics, which uh, I shared the other day, I used to balance the grades of my psychology. <laughs> yeah, so, so, but I, I thought that was the best decision I've, I've made in, in my, uh, for my university education because it benefited me way beyond my, uh, my college days. And uh, I would say that uh, it, it drastically expanded my uh, 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 horizon uh, in my career, my career potential. I started, uh, after we founded our company, we, uh, I started as a chief technology officer. I did all the programming, all the computer science stuff. Then after that, I developed into a, a manager, then eventually uh, a, a businessman. I would say my uh, education in my university in the uh, social sciences and also psychology uh, equipped, prepared me well for this uh, transition. And I'm very grateful of the advice that my uh, uh, first year advisor given me, right? So I'm, I'm very, very grateful of that. So that's on my personal front. On the, on the work side, um, uh, we are probably, yeah, as, uh, as, uh, as a Prof Tan said, we are a big employer. 
of, uh, of the uh, 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 students uh, from NUS as well as uh, from the from other uh, universities and uh, IHLs. We hire right now about 150 to do about 200 uh, new, uh, new hires every month. So that translates about 2,000 a year, right? So Prof Dan uh, uh, was, uh, uh, came to our launch event of our Shopee building, which is not far away from here, like last year. And uh, that time, I think we have about 1,000 uh, employees, 1,005. Now the building is already full with 3,000, and we are building another building that's next door of a similar size uh, to, to hire more people. And uh, I will say that uh, uh, for a lot of the hires, uh, we focus less on the knowledge they possess. Right, so that, of course, for certain subjects like computer science programming, we care uh, a lot about his, uh, you know, knowledge in, in programming and coding and all this. But for a big chunk of the hires, we focus more less on the the knowledge itself, but more on the characters, the softer part of the of the of the candidates. Is he uh, innovative enough? Creative enough? Is he open-minded? Uh, can he adapt well? And uh, is he an interesting person? Right. So I think those qualities. And uh, we'll, uh, it is, uh, are the things that we, we, we uh, look more in our candidates for very practical reasons. Because if we look at the nature of work and type of jobs, if we think about 15 years ago, iPhone don't even exist. You know, and, uh, and people now think about iPhone like uh, mobile phones as uh, take for granted. But we, we, we don't forget this wasn't so 15 years ago. When I start work, we still using I mean, Palm, I think, for, for PDAs at, at that time, if, if uh, you, you all remember. But now, like, a mobile is everywhere, internet is everywhere. And I believe in 15 years' time from now on, we're probably working with something that probably don't even exist today. Right? So, and, uh, and so, so, so the nature of jobs has changed uh, uh, very, very fast. And also with the uh, advancement of AI and data, a lot of the uh, knowledge-intensive uh, or perceived to be knowledge intensive jobs that's uh, of the today or, or yesterday would uh, become uh, something that robots can do better than humans uh, in the days to come so so what happened to our jobs right so i would say that when people talk about ai the replacement jobs people like uh, uh, more thinking about fear about feel the threat and all this but i would say if you look at it from another perspective maybe it's a, a way of uh, liberation Right? So the thing is, uh, you know, if the things uh, liberate the humans from the things that, uh, that, uh, that the robots can do and uh, well, can ask people to focus more on the uh, creative uh, side of things, which, uh, which make human unique. Mm -hmm. I would say it's harder because now you can no longer just memorize books, study the, the field, then they have the job for the rest of your career. It's harder, but it will be more interesting. Right? So whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. It's... How, then, then the question comes back to the, to the education in general, like a specific here for university education. How do you prepare the students for the nature of the work in the future? It's harder, but it's more interesting. And I think for the, uh, the, today, the launch of the College uh, of uh, Humanities and the Sciences is, uh, is, the right, is the step in the big step in the right direction. Yeah, thanks, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, I liked your story a lot. <laughs> In fact, uh, his story, I mean, at the undergraduate level, he was able to read computer science, uh, psychology, economics, and mathematics. Uh, this is something which the new College of Humanities uh, would allow you to do. But right. Prof Dan, <laughs> let me just add one point. Right? But there's a little bit of regret yeah, for, my, for my university education. I took these subjects right, as individual subjects. Right? So the things I have to go to different places, and, and there's not so much of a linkages between them. And I have to make the linkage. Uh, maybe one of the linkages is to balance out the grades. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so, so, but I think with the College of Humanity, Science, uh, Humanities and Sciences, you actually have a curated... Uh, subjects, you actually lay out the plan for you, right? So to, to not only on the subjects themselves, but also uh, uh, provide the, the, the linkages or uh, the connection between these uh, subjects, which I felt uh, uh, if I were given the, you know, those kind of uh, uh, opportunity, I would have appreciated a lot. Thank you. Thank you for making a very important pitch on interdisciplinarity, because that's the connection that Ye Kang is talking about, that our common curriculum 
is comprised of the 13 modules. Uh, those are actually uh, 13 clusters of connected disciplines, right? Whether you look at integrated humanities, you look at Asian studies, or even you look at AI, all those actually are a few disciplines in itself, right? Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps it's time for us to look at some of the questions. Uh, we, we have suggested that uh, audience, remote and physical, can actually put in their questions through the pigeonhole. Right. And uh, we have one question. Is there still room for one's interest and passion with an interdisciplinary education? Um, would you like to answer this? This sounds more like a question <laughs> for Ing Chai to answer. <laughs> Uh, it's actually plenty of room. That's what I want to say. Plenty of room. And uh, uh, earlier we have mentioned that the major requirements have been reduced and the major requirements takes about one third of the entire curriculum, entire four-year curriculum. Currently, it's about 50%. So that reduction uh, is significant to provide more flexibility. And it's always constantly, we are trying to measure the breadth as well as the depth, right? And so this is one direction we are moving uh, with the new college. So uh, no, no restriction at all. Next question will be, will the future of work in Singapore be different from the future of work in larger economies, say US, China, India, given our local context and uh, resources? Uh, I would say, yes, part of the answer would be jobs will be quite different in Singapore, in China, in India, in US. Uh, but there are also some, I would say, characteristics that would be similar. Right? And perhaps I think uh, in a uh, tech company, that you see actually sprouting all throughout, right? In US, in China, in Singapore, uh, you see that they are actually quite similar, right? And Singapore is always, I would say, at the forefront in some of this aspect. You may have heard that just last Friday, the MAS has announced the digital banking license. And congratulations, I think, to C. Thank you. For for uh, uh, being one of the two who have gotten the full digital license uh, for banking. Perhaps you can share with us a little bit about what sort of work would be in this particular new outfit that you have. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, I, I think, uh, uh, again, uh, firstly, thank you. Yeah, so, so, so maybe I share a little bit of... Uh, why interdisciplinary like uh, uh, education is important for the for the work? I'll give you some like uh, very concrete examples. Let's say take example say uh, marketing, right? So for Shopee marketing or let's say for C money the the bank marketing or this marketing. When you talk about marketing, what do you have in mind? You you think about the the Pachukang, you know the Gurmit Singh doing the, <laughs> the doing the doing the uh, TV advertisement for. For, for, for our, for our uh, events and all this, right? But behind that, there's a lot of uh, data analytics as well, right? So about, it, it's about that there's about, you know, like uh, about, uh, it's about real, real time when you, when, you, when you push out some messages, put some like uh, uh, notifications, when I, I'm sure a lot of you receive uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, notification from the uh, various uh, e-commerce apps and all those things. There's a lot of uh, sciences going to there because we only have a limited chance of sending to people. So who to send? Are all those messages the same? Actually, it's different. So the, the message that actually pushed to you and all this is different. Right, so the thing is, uh, so that requires a lot of understanding about about data, about and uh, using the tool in data analytics to to uh, facilitate those things. But also, if you look about the the uh, social sciences point uh, side of things, let's say for Indonesia, for for Philippines, you also need to understand a lot of the social context on what are the things that you want to uh, project to people, what kind of messages you want to come to people. So actually, even for our marketing department, for the people that do well in our marketing department to the consumer side, are the ones who are 
maybe engineer trained, can be engineer trained, but he have a lot of understanding about the social context uh, of the people's mind and all these things. So, so, so jobs like that is no longer, either it's from a very creative, uh, very creative, very uh, the art side of things, and it's also not the other extreme, of very analytical, it's a combination of those. I would say that, uh, you know, for, the, for, the, for a lot of the jobs in our, in our company will be an a intersection of, uh, of the uh, 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 multidisciplinary uh, approach right, for, for, for those jobs. Yeah. Uh, we have a very interesting question, and I think this is the question that uh, you hear often. How do we keep ourselves employable when many jobs are lost to automation, robots, and technology? Yeah, so maybe I answer. Yeah? Yes. So this one I shared just now. This is something that's going to happen, right? So the thing is that, that, that the nature of jobs will be changed, even for doctors, right? So the thing is uh, now with the AI, uh, doctors essentially is that uh, you have the basic knowledge of uh, you know symptoms and the diagnosis and the treatment and all this. So it's about build on about about knowledge and the experience. But with AI, it can study maybe a doctor that can study in hundred years. Maybe an AI a robot can study in say one year. And uh, maybe the next iteration of the robots they already built on this one year. They they study another one year, which is another hundred years. So eventually, it will be very very hard for uh, a lot of the uh, uh, doctors to compete. Uh, with uh, robots for certain for certain kind of work, right? So so the thing is, it will happen. Then then what happened uh, to to uh, to to uh, to to these jobs and uh, it's replaced? So that's why I say that uh, uh, the university education should focus more on the uh, characters. Uh, are you resilient? Are you innovative? Are you creative? And uh, and those things that robots cannot replace. And also for doctors. Do you have that human touch? How do you interact with the with the patients, right? And and those, those, or maybe you focus on the harder things where those are you no know, the the general illness doesn't 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 give, right? So I would say that the uh, uh, the way to counter this uh, 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 potential uh, prospect of the loss of jobs through automation or this with a positive mind, you you see as a liberation of what humans are really capable of. And uh, you train yourself in things that uh, the robots cannot do. Creativity, innovation, resilience, those type of things. And uh, once you, it's harder to do, but it's something you have to do. Once you are good in those areas, you shouldn't be afraid anymore. Thank you. If I can just quickly add to what Ye Kang has said. Uh, one first point, uh, yes, jobs will be lost through automation, robots, and so on. But jobs will also be created. And in fact, studies uh, have actually indicated that at every industrial revolution, there are actually more jobs created than destroyed. Every industrial re revolution, in, we, and we believe this fourth industrial revolution that we are going through, there will be more jobs created. Right? And the type of jobs that are created would definitely require uh, certain components of technology, right? No doubt about it. And what Ye Kang is saying is that you should not try to emulate what robots do because those are actually typically more routine type of works, right? You should actually try to learn more what robots cannot do. Right? And that falls under the humanities, social sciences, but things that, uh, in terms of engaging people, all right, uh, these are examples that are robots will not be able. And that's where uh, to do, and that's where I think soft skills, which what is what uh, uh, Ye Kang has mentioned, features very importantly. And I like to sort of remind everyone that... Uh, it, interdisciplinarity is training a different type of mental disposition. Right? If we do interdisciplinarity well, the mind will be more agile. Right? The mind will be more agile and we will be more adaptable. And that actually puts or builds very strong attributes right, in our students to prepare them for a world that is changing. 
of course, by technology. Right. Anything to add? I, I would say I couldn't agree more. I think those were the two main things that I thought about. I think even with automation, robots, uh, a lot more technology, someone still needs to make the technology, someone needs to maintain the technology, someone needs to think through the systems integration, the process flow, uh, and so on. So I think even in, in the engineering type of area, uh, that's a lot more jobs, different type of jobs that can be created. And I think this element of humanity, I think in a world with a lot more technology, robots, automation, this element of humanity, the soft skills that Ain Chai uh, touched on, all the more important. And I think that's why in uh, education system in the universities, that's something that we also prize and we stress um, a great deal. I think that's important for students go to go through that formative uh, development as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question is also a common question. Uh, will interdisciplinary learning cause us to be a jack of all trades and a master of none? Okay. All right. So the, the key thing is this. Uh, we have to uh, be prepared for a change of mindset. And one of the change in this mindset uh, is that your learning runway is going to be much longer. A four-year university education is insufficient for a career that can run for 40 to 50 years or even longer. Right? Uh, in the past, it seems that once you have studied for four years, you get a great job and you have a job for life. But the paradigm has changed now to a lifetime of jobs. You need to change jobs many times. So this is where continuing education or lifelong education features extremely strong. So you may not have enough depth, for instance, in a particular discipline in your four years, but given that your horizon is another 40 years, you can always come back and top up your skills and knowledge as it goes along. Right? So that's the, the change in concept that you actually have a much longer runway for learning and why lifelong education is more important. But coupled with this, uh, they're very important. We need to constantly unlearn and relearn. So we have to be able to build that capability to unlearn and relearn, right? To learn for life. Uh, so that's something which, again, it is one of the important skill sets for us to have. So I think if you have that mindset, then that question uh, uh, naturally would not uh, be an issue. So, Prof Tang, I echo that. So, my answer to that, if people ask me this question, I will say, you are thinking too much. <laughs> I think, like, you, you know, like, if you, if you, if you think, hey, am I, you know, like, kiasuma, like, am I learning, like, too, too, too little, you know, too wide, but not deep enough? If, if you really love certain pro uh, subject, you feel the calling of all this, you, it will be very natural to you to spend a lot of time learning that. But if you haven't, you know, like don't feel that, I think it's time just to explore as much as possible at st this stage, the university, this, uh, this age and this stage of your life. Yeah, you'll be, it will be, eventually it will be much more beneficial to you. Yeah. Um, maybe if I just sh uh, add on, um, just to share a more personal um, experience on this. Um, so I... I I went through a more liberal arts kind of education, um, enjoyed a little bit of this, uh, the features that we talk about today in the College of Humanities and Science. Um, and so I, one day I was choosing the modules um, for my next semester. I was a major in chemistry uh, at that time, but dabbled a lot in other areas, um, uh, especially economics. Um, and I came across this course or this module, um, Environmental Science, economics and public policy. 
Um, and at that time, I was thinking about a policy job in government. And when I came across this module, I thought, oh, wow, there's a confluence of two things that I do and maybe one thing that would be useful to me in, in, in the future. Um, and then I, I took up the module. I mean, at that time, it was a module interdisciplinary, um, not very common. But today, I mean, it's, it's something that is a big area. I think when we talk about sustainability, we talk about how uh, economists uh, are in this area looking at carbon tax, so on and so forth. It's a very, very deep uh, disciplinary area. So I thought just to say too that I, I don't think it's necessarily a trade-off. Um, uh, there is a lifelong perspective that we also want to take. Um, there is uh, sort of maybe also don't think too much uh, kind of mentality that we should also have. But I think just to keep an eye on um, what we are interested in, what is maybe the next few steps that we are thinking about, you know, the jobs that we, that we think we are going to do, that therefore this particular module might be useful um, in preparing ourselves uh, for the workforce. Yeah. Well, I think there's this famous story of Steve Jobs who took a course on calligraphy. All right, he did it for fun, but actually it's very instrumental in the, the new fonts that the Apple uh, sort of software has. Uh, I also have many examples. I mean, I'm, I'm trained as a mathematician, right? And my really first exposure uh, on interdisciplinarity is when we were actually setting up our special program in science. Right, because uh, we thought that, well, it would be nice to teach science in an integrated manner. That's 25 years ago. Right? And how to bring in uh, physics, uh, chemistry, biology, and mathematics together in a very integrated way. And uh, by designing that particular program, I actually learned lots more of physics, uh, chemistry, and uh, biology. And a as a student, actually, I used to hate biology. <laughs> because to me, uh, biology is just a lot of memorization. But university level, biology is actually very fascinating. Right? And somehow, you know, when even more interesting, when you see them all fused together. Right? And... Uh, in a way, I guess the sky is the limit. And I need to even do even more or learn even more when I became dean. When I'm dean of the Faculty of Science, I have to understand what my faculty members do in terms of their research. And sometimes I would need to... I can't read the whole paper, but at least I try to read the first page. <laughs> Again, it's fascinating because... Part of my job when I was Dean of the Faculty of Science is also to be able to sell, all right, sell or publicize the research uh, outcomes of my professors in the Faculty of Science. And I learned a lot of science that way. And basically, I just know that I have to learn it. Right? And interestingly, I guess, all of us have this capability. It's just whether you want to activate that capability and potential. All of us can learn. And I like uh, Ye Kang's example, is that he knows jolly well that if he's taken a course on psychology, his GPA is going to, to suffer. And his EDB scholarship, uh, it's going to be uh, stopped if <laughs> his GPA fall, fall below a certain point. But yet, you just do it, right? And, and don't bother about grades. I think that's one important sort of Still advice. bother, like I use math to balance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he hatch, all right? He knows that if he takes a psychology uh, module, he has to balance with a maths module where he can score A's. <laughs> but it's much harder, right? Because a C is not automatic that by scoring an A, you can push it up. But uh, uh, I think these are personal examples. I just want to emphasize that uh, all of us have that potential and you can do it. And I think that brings us, uh, we sort of have answered this question. The need to be a lifelong learner is evident and well understood. 
perhaps the panelists can share how it is that they actively practice this mindset in their own lives. So we have each shared some examples of uh, lifelong learning. Right. Yeah. For me, uh, I would say that uh, uh, I do it every day. Right. I, I learn every day. I think, and it's a it's a very enriching experience for myself, and I really enjoy this. I think if I I I always ask myself, am I am I better than I I was uh, one year ago? And, uh, and then compared to like three years ago, do I did I did I uh, did I uh, uh, learn more things? Am I a better person? Uh, do I know more things? And uh, and my life is more interesting. I will say uh, yes, right. So it's even in our business. I started from programming, then go into management. We go into the game publishing business, then learn about uh, game development. Then about then we switch totally change field to e-commerce. Right, so it's e-commerce is a totally different field. Then understand about you know about 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 marketing, about how to run e-commerce, about about then about then also then now we are also going to digital financial services. Again, it's a totally different field. I need to get interviewed so they, in all the regulatory bodies they will have this thing called fit and proper test. I need to go there and to show them I really understand this field well. Right, so I need to study about finance, about banking, about all these things. And uh, and even on geography wise, we we uh, we we started in uh, Singapore, Southeast Asia. Now we are big in Latin America, in India, in Middle East, in Africa. So so we also we actually did a learning trip to to Brazil, and uh, uh, the the our uh, uh, executive team actually went to the Amazon forest. Uh, to swim in the Amazon River as well, right? Just to get a sense of the culture there. You need to be there to understand the market. So all these are learning for me, and I really enjoy this. And uh, and I, I yeah I I feel that it's, uh, it's uh, life is really about a life of learning. You keep learning new things, and you feel yourself a better person. I strongly encourage that. Thanks. And just to add that within our system, uh, as also alluded to by Wei Ling, we always try to build in uh, different opportunities for our students to learn. So the experiential learning which Wei Lin talked about and also uh, the uh, internships uh, which Wei Lin also alluded to. Uh, these are examples where students learn in different ways. And the experiential learning is something that we're actually making it uh, more prominent especially with an interdisciplinary curriculum, right? Uh, the explanation is simple, right? Uh, the real-world problems are out there, right? The people, the companies uh, that are dealing with those problems, they have access to the challenges. So when are we send our students as an intern there, they actually are exposed to those problems. But maybe the students may not be able to... Uh, solve the problems, they will bring the problem back to our professors. And in, so in, in doing so, of course, the professors can help them solve, but it, the professor is also sensitized about what are the problems out there, and so they can integrate it into their curriculum. So you'll see that uh, internship is one particular aspect that we are trying to put more focus on. We already have many uh, internships which are manda mandatory for uh, ma various programs in NUS. Uh, in the Faculty of Science, for instance, your data science uh, program, data science and analytics program, has a, an internship requirement of one and a half years, right? which is longer than usual. But we will try to put in more of these internship uh, opportunities now, about uh, lifelong learning, uh, a few sort of mental attributes or disposition that are actually important. All right? uh, one is actually the curiosity of the mind. We have to always remain curious. Right? There are many things that we don't know. Right? Even professors, we don't know many things. But we have to always be mentally curious and willing to learn. And I think that is extremely important. Right? So keep your mind open, be mentally curious. I think that's one important 
attribute that we have to bring with all, the, all of us. Now, we have our final question. What will be the top three competencies we need to have to prepare ourselves for the future of work? You have, want to have a step? Sure. Waiting? Thank you. Um, I struggle a little bit thinking about technical competencies um, because in a way that evolves over time, I think as the industry evolves. Um, uh, but I thought to maybe put out there maybe a few things to think about. Um, one, I think it's on the personal qualities front. Um, and I'll start off with the word curiosity that Aung Chai just touched on. I think there's a certain um, need for all of us to continue to learn, be open-minded, to be curious. And that's how we keep relearning and, and building up our skill set, our competencies. There's a need for us to be adaptable in different situations um, and to be resilient. So that's the first bundle of about the personal uh, qualities bit. Three things in there. Um, second area I thought to touch on was actually the regional and the global orientation that I think each one of us should have. I think Singapore is small. Um, I think in Singapore, uh, we need to know Singapore's place in the world. Uh, when we work uh, in industry, in the business context, where business networks opportunities are going to be, where they will take us. Understanding the interconnections across countries and working with uh, uh, different stakeholders um, internationally, globally. So I thought that's the other area that uh, is important. And finally, um, working with people. I, I think that would be very, very critical. So they are not new at all. I mean, they are all quite well-known things. Three, two, one, three, uh, the three personal qualities to the regional and the global orientation. And then one, I think just working well with people. Yeah. Thank you very much, Willing. I just want to add one more to hers. Complex problem solving. For the pro modern day problems are all complex and usually cannot be solved through the approaches of one single discipline. Uh, that's where uh, interdisciplinarity features very strongly when we solve complex problems. Ye Kang, anything to add? Sure. Maybe I offer from, uh, again, from two perspectives. One is on the practical uh, competencies. I think first, uh, uh, maybe you need to have uh, some level of uh, basic digital literacy, right? To understand how to use the computers and the basic, you know, in data analytics tools and all this understanding of that. Second is... Uh, on the, you need to have some good engineering, like a, a fundamental and backgrounds. Understand how to work with numbers, right? With logics, right? Uh, solving problems step by step and all this. I think that's uh, that's important. And the last one is uh, on the uh, humanity side of things. You need to understand how to work with people. Understand about about cultures and the social context, right? Working with people, people's behavior, as well as uh, Singapore is a small country. Inevitably, if you want to do more, you venture to other places, how to understand those uh, social and the cultural context. Those are very important uh, 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 qualities one need to have. On the character side, I would say uh, three things. Like first is uh, creativity. Uh, second is uh, uh, adaptability, you need to adapt. And the last one is uh, resilience and uh, just keep trying. I think that's, uh, those are three qualities that's very important for the future of work. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we have come to actually towards the end. Uh, perhaps I can invite uh, Wei Ling and uh, Yi Kang to just do a one or two minute uh, quick sort of uh, uh, a summary of what you want to convey to our audience. Yekang, you want to try? <laughs> I thought since I started, I would give Yekang a chance to start. But anyway, um, thanks very much. Um, I think it's, uh, 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 I think some reflections, uh, I think from the last one hour, so I think having this opportunity to do the Q&A. Um, first, I think I'm very heartened that uh, at NUS here, you're taking this step. Um, and I think trying to push ahead to better uh, prepare our undergraduate students for the future. Um, and I think uh, there have been some common threads in the things that we've talked about, I think in terms of future of work, what are the challenges ahead, and therefore how that informs 
the imperatives in education in, and in the undergraduate years. And so I think those are things that we need to hold dear. I think the last question in particular about, you know, if you had to identify the three competencies uh, that our graduates would need in the workplace. I think even as we talk about um, uh, some of the specific uh, causes and all that, I thought that foundation, um, the complex problem solving, uh, a certain comfort with numbers, uh, analytics, um, and the personal qualities, uh, the external orientation, I thought that basket uh, is perhaps something that we should fix our minds on, I think in terms of how we improve education uh, going forward. And I think that would be certainly a good start uh, thinking ahead. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Wei Lin. Uh, yeah. Yekang? Sure, Thank, thanks again. Thanks, Wei Lin and uh, Prof. Prof Ta. And uh, again, uh, very big uh, congratulations right, to, the, to the NUS for the launch of this uh, uh, College of Humanities and, uh, and the Sciences. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I really think this is the uh, big step in the right direction. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful and I feel very heartened that the NUS is taking the right steps in, uh, in, in first is producing the right, you know, in, in incorporating the, incorporating the, 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 incorporating the right qualities for the, uh, uh, for the students, for the right jobs for the future. Um, and uh, and uh, I always uh, to I always share share with uh, uh, Prof Tan before that uh, I always wanted my son to uh, send my son to NUS, but I always have this uh, you know a little bit of doubt is uh, should I send him to an engineering degree or to a science degree? Now there's no more this problem, and uh, and uh, yeah I'll put the how they put on put on record here that uh, I'll be very happy to send my kid to the College of Humanities and Sciences if he got accepted. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, excellent. I can't get a better endorsement. <laughs> well, uh, I, I'd like to leave the audience with basically three points. Uh, my first point is uh, the high quality of Singapore's educational system. Uh, we are amongst the best, if not the best, education system in the world. And... Uh, have confidence that uh, our students and all of us are actually well prepared right, for the changing uh, workplace, changing world. Right? Second point uh, is a request for incoming students and even uh, graduates to adopt a change in mindset along two dimensions, right? Uh, one is that university provides many options and choices, right? The power is in the hands of the learner or the student. And the learner or the student has to take their responsibility to own their own intellectual development. Right? So that's one change in the mindset. The second change in the mindset is, I've mentioned earlier, the runway for learning. It's no more four years. It's actually 40 to 50 years. Which brings us to my third point on lifelong education. Uh, what would prepare you well for a lifetime of learning, right? One, uh, it's a very broad interdisciplinary intellectual foundation. That broadness and that connectedness allows you to actually build on this foundation. The second point uh, for lifelong learning, it's the ability for all of us to really learn, unlearn, and relearn. And we are talking about 40 to 50 years. And some of the important attributes that we talked about earlier, being open-minded, being uh, curious, uh, these are actually all important attributes or mental dispositions for us to try to uh, acquire and refine as we learn. 
So happy learning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Ms. Lai, Mr. Ye, and Prof. Tan. I would like to invite our CHS co-deans, Prof. Robbie Goh and Prof. Sun Ye Neng, to join our distinguished panelists and Prof. Tan on stage for a group photo. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's session. We hope that you've enjoyed the official launch of the College of Humanities and Sciences and hearing from our distinguished panellists. Thank you once again for joining us. Stay, Stay safe, safe and, and have, have a pleasant, pleasant day ahead. ahead.